Good day, Turbo fans and retro game enthusiasts. Welcome to another episode of Turbo Tuesday. Released in 1991 for the TurboGrafx CD, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is one of the first full motion video games for the console. Set in the fictional 19th century London, you embark on an adventure to solve three cases alongside the famous Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Gather information from the London Times, character interviews, and locations, and use your deductive reasoning skills to solve these cases. Use your notebook to record any information to present your case and maybe solve the mystery. Sherlock Holmes' consulting detective uses groundbreaking full motion video with live actors and sets. This is a first for video game consoles at the time. To solve each case, you must listen to the video clips of Sherlock and Watson as they interview the client. Then you must travel to locations or interview individuals to gather clues. Once you are satisfied with your findings, you can attempt to solve the case by presenting your findings to the judge. Your final score is determined by the number of visits it took you to solve the case. This game takes advantage of the CD-ROM format by using full motion video. The video clips present solid acting and dialogue even though they are small in size and by no means near today's quality. Make sure you take notes as there are clues in each of the video segments. If you enjoy solving puzzles, try this game out. Watch the video for some footage of the game. Thank you for watching and please stay tuned for the next episode of Turbo Tuesday. Follow us on Twitter for the latest updates. What rubbish! What bald it is! You must have read something terribly disturbing, Watson, for you to be so overwrought this early in the morning. Indeed, Holmes. It's irresponsible of the times to play upon people's superstitions. Ah, you must be referring to the affair of the mummy's curse. It has the entire city in an uproar. Three men dead, and they expect us to believe that a 4,000-year-old mummy was the murderer. I'm surprised you haven't taken some interest in this case, Holmes. To the contrary, my dear Watson. I have made some inquiries, because I dare say I do believe this murderer is a much younger chap. May we be of some assistance, Inspector Smythe? General Farnsworth Armstead, one of the six surviving Waterloo Tontine ticket holders, has been murdered. Waterloo Tontine? The Waterloo Tontine was a lottery of sorts, Watson. It was set up in 1815 to aid the veterans of the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington's victory over Napoleon. Yes, of course, I knew that. Quite an ingenious plan on the part of the founders. One pound bought a ticket in the name of some young relative. The ticket proceeds amounted to over a million pounds. Half went immediately to veterans and their families for medical and hardship expenses. What became of the other half? It all went into an account at the Bank of England, where it's been collecting interest all these years. Very clever. And how does one win this prize? Simply by outliving all the other ticket holders. Mm, and now you say one of them has been murdered. Very suspicious. Who are the remaining five? The oldest is Captain Robert Jurgens, age 82. Then there are Anita and Claire Thomas, who are 80-year-old twins. William Rowland is 79, and Peter Dudley is 77. Poor General Armstead was the youngest at 74. Seems as if he would have had the best chance to outlive the others. I recall reading something in the Times about a big to-do involving the Tontine survivors on the 18th. That's correct. The Waterloo Anniversary Banquet at the Langham Hotel. Why is the name Armstead familiar? He was a noted art collector, I believe. He also authored a well-known book, Treasures of the Conquerors. Quite right. At the time of his death, General Armstead was working on a revised edition for his publisher, Nugget and Company. It was to contain an entirely new chapter on a fabulous diamond called the Polar Star, which at one point belonged to Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. 
the general had new information which traced the gem to its present owner. Tell me about the circumstances of General Armstead's death. Oh, yes, of course. Well, let me see. At 10 o'clock this morning, the general's valet, David Sennett, admitted a call to the general's study. Sennett says he did not know the man. He was elderly and spoke with a French accent. Sennett told him the general never saw anyone in the morning while he was at work. The gentleman insisted that if Armstead read the letter he had with him, he would make an exception. And so it was. Sennett took the letter in, Armstead read it, and went quite pale. He told Senate to let the gentleman in. Sensing something amiss, Senate dawdled in the area of the study for the next 15 minutes or so. Then he heard the distinct sound of swordplay. He tried to enter the study, but found the door locked. Then he heard the crash of breaking glass. He raced to the kitchen and out the back door to enter the study from the garden. By the time he got there, the call had vanished and the general was leaning heavily against a shattered display case of military miniatures. Before Senate could assist him, he dropped a saber from his hand and fell over dead. And I take it the letter which so upset the general was nowhere to be found. Correct, Mr. Holmes. Well, we shall put our brains and our feet to the task. Society burglar strikes again. Mm, series of burglaries. Six over the period from June 2nd to June 17th. On July 2nd, the 7th occurred at the home of Sir Sanford Leeds. Cleopatra Tiara stolen, it says. As in the other cases, uh, no sign of extensive search by the thief and only one piece of jewelry involved. Victims elsewhere at the time. Here's a complete list of the particulars, Holmes, if you'd care to read it. How do you do, gentlemen? I am Gerald Locke. Please be seated, Mr. Locke. How can we be of service? Three days ago, Guy Clarendon was found murdered at Halliday's. It's preposterous, but Miss Frances Nolan has been charged and is being detained at the criminal court, Old Bailey. Frances Nolan? Ah, yes. Sister of Loretta Nolan. Only surviving heirs of Sir Malcolm Nolan, founder of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. I seem to recall that Sir Malcolm and Lady Nolan were killed when some lunatic threw a bomb into their carriage. It seems to me that later I heard something about it being a case of mistaken identity. Wasn't one of their little offspring in the carriage with them at the time? Yes, it was Loretta, Francis's sister. She was only four. Miraculously, she was uninjured. Mr. Locke, I've heard that you are a suitor for Miss Francis Nolan's hand, are you not? Yes. And was it not also true that she was being courted by Guy Clarendon? Unfortunately, yes. Have you any idea why Frances Nolan was charged with the crime? Ah, uh, well, she was discovered over the body with a pistol in her hand. That would do it. But you don't understand. Frances is totally incapable of murder, not even of a scoundrel such as Guy Clarendon. Scoundrel? But he's from such blue blood. Also, if I'm not mistaken, he's an accomplished batsman for the West London Cricketeers, a ranked fencer in international competition. He was also a bit of a bounder, Watson. What an understatement. Guy Clarendon was excessively fond of cards and strong drink. His father had all but disinherited him. I tried to tell Francis that Clarendon was no good, but to no avail. And now look at the mess she's in. Will you help? Most certainly. 